Hello and welcome to a new episode of Entheogenic Renaissance. As you may have noticed, I've made a slight rebranding and as of now I will be referring to this podcast exclusively this way, because it is indeed an Entheogenic Renaissance. Today I'm going to talk to you about psychedelics, mental health and lessons from more than 50 behavioral change workshops that I have personally conducted for top executives in big multinational companies, let's put it this way. I've got a lot to share, but of course I'm not going to be sharing everything, otherwise what would be left for the rest of the episodes in this podcast, after all. But since I'm talking about the therapeutic potential of entheogens, it is critical to provide the knowledge and the tools on how to use them in the therapeutic context. And by the end of this episode you will learn that they're not a magic pill, Fortunately or unfortunately for some people, you cannot just pop a pill or eat a mushroom and then hope that your depression will go away, will fade away and things would be very different as of now. Not gonna happen. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you here. But there is science behind it and I will try to structure my conversation today around certain aspects of infusions. First aspect is called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity as a concept can be basically explained as an ability for our brain to implement change in the neural circuits, meaning creating new neuron connections, unlearning or learning new skills. You heard me right, unlearning is required when it comes to change, because this is the thing about our brain. Even though it consumes at least a third of entire energy consumption of our body, it has amazing quality. And that quality is energy saving mode. You heard me right. So when you acquire a new skill, your brain is trying to put that skill into a sub-perception route. Meaning you don't need to think about it when you are doing something. And I guess you can relate when you're making breakfast or making coffee, you're not really thinking much on what exactly you're doing unless it is a new recipe that you're following or a new way of making a nice brew in the morning. By the way, there are certain protocols around coffee that I've learned from, shit, what is it? 60 podcast episodes of Huberman Lab. I've subscribed that at some point in time and I can share a lot of information from the knowledge that I've gathered there as well. But not in this particular episode, because this episode is dedicated to mental health. So neuroplasticity can be opened through various types of efforts. When you're learning a new skill or language or something else, you're building new neuron connections. And it is hard. If you've learned something recently, I bet you can relate to that. It's not that easy. It is easier to learn new skill if you're less than 25, because at the age of 25, your brain reached the maximum level of development. It doesn't mean that you're not going to develop any further. <laughs> no. But the majority of roots, let's put it this way, the majority of neural circuits has already formed. The ability of our brain to learn doesn't vanish though, and if you've done something to yourself, like got a burn from a hot cup of tea, for instance, oh, I'm not gonna do it right now. No, it's good. So, if you've burned yourself with a hot cup of tea, your neurons create a new connection. Unfortunately, it is a bit tragic, but you now learn that it's too hot to drink and maybe next time you won't do this mistake. So this is neuroplasticity in a nutshell. Ability to learn and form new connections. There is a model that describes acquiring any new skill or knowledge, and it can be explained in four different modes. I'll walk you through them. So the first one is unconscious incompetence, then it is conscious incompetence, then it is conscious competence, and in the end is unconscious competence. So how does it work? Imagine you are trying to learn how to ride a bike, which I learned at 19 years old. Unfortunately, my father wasn't there to teach me, so I had to do it on my own. 
So when I tried to, I of course was in a state of unconscious incompetence, I didn't know how to ride a bike, I didn't try it before, so I was oblivious of this knowledge and how to balance myself and not to fall. Then I tried a couple of times and I fell, hit there, I was in a state of conscious incompetence, meaning I now know that I cannot ride a bike. But then again, with my effort and with my intention, I proceeded further. And I went to a third stage, which I just told you about, is conscious competence, meaning full concentration of my body to hold the balance, hold the steering wheel and try not to fall and move further using my legs. So this is the most hard part of any learning journey. And then of course, with experience that I acquired through trials and errors, I came to a mode of unconscious competence, meaning I don't need to concentrate on how to ride a bike. I learned the skill, I've acquired it, and my brain created new connections that would allow me to save energy so that I don't need to learn next time. What they say, if you know how to ride a bike, you probably will ride a bike. As they say, you need to learn to ride a bike just once in your life, and probably next time you're gonna be okay with it, if not master it. So this is the concept of neuroplasticity, and there are other things related with entheogens, of course, but this is the critical one. So what it does is that it opens a window for potential change. And what entheogens do, they give you a fresh perspective, they give you an egoless understanding of your own psyche as if you're looking at yourself from distance, maybe nearby, but then you are in a state where you can kind of objectively observe yourself with all the existing flaws, with all the problems, with all the mental constructs that you already have in place. So what so when people experience this, they have this epiphany that they've been doing something, let's say, not in their favor. Some neuroscientists call it da moment. Basically, when you are experiencing something revelational, typically it is quite a common knowledge in a sense, like don't smoke, don't drink a lot of alcohol, you know, exercise, sleep well, eat well, and things like this. But the thing is that entheogens help you gain this fresh perspective with a fresh set of eyes, your own eyes, not somebody else's, and then, well, theoretically deal with it. And the idea of psychedelic assisted therapy is that the therapist there is helping you foster the change through the process of integration. I've discussed it before, I'm not gonna go into details there right now. Today, I want to mention a couple of other things. My recent involvement with an open foundation. This is an this is a Netherlands-based non-profit dedicated to destigmatizing psychedelics. It's been in business, or I guess business is not the right word for a non-profit here. They've been doing it for several years. Yeah. They've been doing it for years, so they've been promoting psychedelics, they've been running conference called ICPR that is going to happen in June in Netherlands, of course. And my participation and involvement in that project, in Open Foundation in the first place, is with the idea to help them build brand strategy. I'm not going to discuss what brand strategy is today, but because I've... because I and my team already started the research and excavations, we started to gather knowledge about other nonprofits in psychedelics. Of course, we started with MAPS, Beckley Foundation, and other various more known and less known, such as ICERS, Mind Foundation, and others. Drug Science in the UK, run by David Nutt, who is very well known for his study on harm reduction and on various harms caused by psychedelics. Don't worry, psychedelics are extremely safe. Not saying that you should do it, of course. In the majority of countries it is still prohibited, although there are 66 jurisdictions where they are decriminalized, at least according to a recent UN report. By the way, UN 
is discussing implementation of psychedelics for therapy in terms of healing various mental illnesses. And if we're talking about mental illnesses, one thing you need to understand is that each year 8 million people die because of mental illnesses all over the world. So this is a pandemic, pretty much, that is happening as we speak, or as I speak at the moment. And there are ways to tackle this epidemic, with the help of entheogens, of course. So I will share the knowledge from the research that I'm doing for Open Foundation in the upcoming episodes, but for now I just want to highlight the following, that there are a lot of non-profits that are working towards destigmatizing psychedelics in the society, normalize the conversation around them, and introduce them in the context of mental health to foster change, to heal various types of mental trauma, illnesses, and so on. One of the pillars of the nonprofits is a company called Beckley, and Beckley Foundation is run by Amanda Fielding, who is a visionary in my view. They have a whole ecosystem of various types of businesses, they even have a venture studio, they have a podcast, they have a mailing list on Substack, and not only that. I'm listening to a lot of podcasts dedicated to psychedelics from various sources, and there was one particular one by The Trip Report, by Beckley Wave Studio, by Beckley Foundation, which was dedicated to a paradigm shift. What I'm talking about here, the paradigm shift that I mentioned is around the change that needs to be implemented around mental health. Once you experience the therapeutic potential of entheogens, the thing that happens next is Monday comes. And on Monday, people typically are not that interested to implement a lot of change, because the routine starts to kick in. The usual neural pathways are being activated and people continue to leave as if nothing happened. And this is the danger, because if there's no intention in place, things won't just change on them own. If on Monday you are still continuing old habits and, I don't know, if you decided to smoke, you're still smoking, what are you gonna do about it? If you are eating a lot of junk food, what are you going to do about it? And mental health is something that has been affected by your microbiome. And this is something that is quite unusual, even though there is a lot of research confirming the connection between brain and gut. So depending on what you eat, depending on what, what type of food you consume, and depending on how good you sleep, exercise, it is all going to affect your mental health. And the concept that requires understanding and comprehension is that all those aspects influence your daily life. Your daily decisions, your daily thoughts, they influence your state of mental health. And entheogens can help you understand vicious circles or patterns, toxic patterns that exist in your mind, but then it is up to you to do something about it. I promise to you to share information about the behavioral change workshops that I conducted myself. I'm just gonna, I'm going to do a small overview of what type of workshops I'm talking about here. So those workshops were conducted for the duration of three and a half days for eight individuals and one facilitator, myself. So I ran roughly 45 or 50 of them, I don't remember exactly, and the topic was dedicated to negotiation. So I was teaching people how to negotiate effectively, but with the goal of behavioral change, because even though you can prepare for any upcoming negotiation, if you don't change the way you think, if you don't change the core pillars of your perception and your behavior, if you don't address them, you're not going to succeed, you're not going to implement anything significant and get a better result. 
So my goal was to facilitate the change of human behavior throughout that workshop. And there was one particular phrase that I like a lot about it. It is said at the very beginning of the first eve of the workshop, if you want to learn, you will. And if you don't, you won't. As easy as that. Imagine the simplicity of this phrase. I mean, duh moment, of course. So what does it say is that an intention is required. If you don't plan to implement any change, don't even bother trying. And this is extremely relevant for the healing potential of entheogens. Because they do require your effort. They do require your conscious decision to do something different. To be in a conscious, competent state of mind. And there are many ways on how to get there. Meditation can definitely help. Other tools as well. But first and foremost, an effort and a conscious decision that are required. Again, if there is no intention, there is no change. I have recently joined a psychedelic coaching program by Psychedelic Coaching Institute. So this is an American-based institute and the program will last for several months. I've just started this particular certification and even though I got a couple of coaching diplomas behind my back, not literally, but I can print them out, I am extremely excited about the knowledge that I'm going to gather from fellow professionals in the psychedelic context, from other coaches and people who are already using entheogens to help people implement changes in their life to improve their mental health. And of course, I will share some of the knowledge that I've gathered, but I am building my own practice to help people be more mentally healthy and work on their self-development, of course, if they want to. <laughs> During this education, I will also participate in a five days intensive in Costa Rica, where I and my fellow cohort members will be exploring the depths of our own psyche and implementing the tools, protocols that, would, that are designed to help people develop themselves further. I know a lot about protocols. I'm implementing a lot of protocols on a daily basis, such as daily exercises, morning cold showers, 17 meditation during the day, breath work, and other things. Of course, food is critical here. And I've recently cut consumption of meat, and so far, pretty good. And of course, by the end of this education, I will gather a lot of tools that I will be implementing in my practice. But one thing that amazed me at all times with my 20 plus years of experience with the psychedelic substances is that doesn't matter what type of trip you have, doesn't matter what type of revelation, epiphany or insight that you happen to have during your journey or experience, however you call it, the most important thing is what you do with it on Monday. I don't know, I guess it is not that common, although in my view it is critical pretty much. Because once you get the knowledge, the most important thing is what you do with it. There is other phrase that I could use here. What I can say here is that it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter what you're doing, what matters is what you do from now on. So how do you implement the knowledge? How do you integrate the insight? How do you integrate the experience in your human connection, in your regular daily protocols, in your food intake that, influ that influences your mental health, this is the most critical aspect and I will be talking a lot about it in the upcoming episodes because I've covered some topics dedicated to various entheogens and it is time to talk about integration. Because this is where we're heading <laughs> from now on. <laughs> Integration. So mundane routine is something that people don't find sexy. It is quite boring, actually, to do certain things, in a sense. But then again, if you change your perception, 
if you build a new neural circuits that would change your vision and understanding and how you think and what meaning you put into those protocols, it would affect your life. If you think that going to sleep at certain time and wake up at certain time is boring, it is for some people. But if you change your perception and if you understand that controlling and making sure that you have a good quality sleep has a direct effect on how you feel, you may then reconsider and start doing something different. And I'm not going to talk to you about a lot of protocols here, but I want to highlight one single thought. Entheogen experience. Entheogen experience does not matter unless you do something about it. So this is the critical. So this is by far the most foundational aspect when it comes to psychedelic assisted therapy or coaching. Hopefully in this episode you've learned something new and I've shared with you some useful information. If it was helpful, please don't forget to like, share, subscribe, spread the knowledge and don't forget to provide your valuable comments because I'm doing it all for you and I want to know what was effective, what is interesting to you and what would you like to learn more. Because I'm pretty much a future psychedelic assisted coach and I have a lot of data and knowledge about infusions. Okay, so let's destigmatize the conversation and normalize discussion of mental health in the context of infusions as well. <laughs> Thank you for watching and listening and until next time. Thank you.